Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're joined today by the Acting Mayor of London, Josh Morgan, the Warden of Middlesex County, Alison Warwick, the Medical Officer of Health for the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Alex Summers, and the Chief Medical Officer for London Health Sciences Centre, Dr. Adam Ducolo. We'd like to welcome the media who are in attendance for this afternoon's briefing and invite them to submit their questions using the question forum here on Microsoft Teams. We'd also like to welcome those tuning in this afternoon on Rogers Television, Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel, as well as those watching on the CTV London website. We'll get to the opening statements right away and we'll start with the Acting Mayor of London, Josh Morgan. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to be honest, there really isn't much to report on my end this afternoon, so I will be brief, uh, at least from a City of London perspective. Uh, however, like everyone on this call, I'm certainly following the daily hospitalization numbers and other metrics with interest. Uh, I am relieved that, well, although less than ideal, the strain on our healthcare system and other sectors seems mostly manageable at this point, although we certainly recognize that it has been a long couple of years for those who work in those frontline situations. I'm also cautiously optimistic that the sixth wave we're currently experiencing won't be, uh, won't result in the negative outcomes to the same degree as we witnessed during the previous Omicron wave. As we wait for more conclusive signals one way or the other, I just want to repeat what I've said before. Do what you can to encourage people to get fully vaccinated. That includes third and fourth shots, depending on your age and circumstances. For those who are already vaccinated, booster shots are a critical layer of protection. Please, please go and get them. Uh, with that, that's all I really had to say for today, and uh, I will turn it over to Warden Warwick. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Morgan. As we see by the numbers presented to us to by the health unit, COVID is still very much present in our communities. We are learning every day that friends, families and co-workers are reporting positive results. We know what measures work to suppress transmission and I urge you to follow these measures. We all really want to be done with this, but unless we are mindful and remember to hand wash, social distance and mask appropriately, COVID will continue to be part of our day to day existence. As we move forward, it is refreshing to speak of some other different aspects of post pandemic recovery. As I am here representing the county, I thought I would share some aspects of my job as the warden of Middlesex County. One of my appointments is as a member of the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. The caucus is a not for profit organization representing more than 1.5 million residents. We aim to enhance the prosperity and overall well being of rural and urban communities across the region. Caucus members work collectively to influence federal and provincial legislation and programs through advocacy, research, analysis and education. I am proud to report that our caucus has identified the following key priorities for 2022. A affordable and attainable housing in rural areas. B workforce development through implementation of the Western Ontario Warden's workforce strategy. C continued broadband infrastructure investment and advocacy and D mental health and addictions. The Western Ontario Warden Warden's caucus will develop a policy framework that member municipalities can use and adapt to expand the opportunities and access to attainable housing. The caucus recently released an excellent report regarding workforce development titled Western Ontario Workforce Strategy. I strongly urge you to read this document as there are many aspects that tie into many projects and concerns that are, we are dealing with daily in the county. One of the report subtitles was building a welcoming inclusive community is crucial to attracting and retaining skilled labor and motivated newcomers. Again, I encourage you to read the report and use the information for guidance throughout the post pandemic recovery. This report can be accessed at www.workforcestrategy.wowc.ca. So now with that news, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Summers. Thank you very much, Warden Warwick and Acting Mayor Morgan. And thanks to all who are joining us this afternoon. The health unit is reporting an additional 30 COVID cases today. Over the weekend, a total 243 additional COVID cases and one additional COVID death were reported. 141 of those cases were reported on Saturday. 102 cases were reported on Sunday. We did report one new death over the weekend. That was an individual in their 90s. 
The risk of COVID-19 in our community continues to be high, although we are starting to see more convincing and sustained indicators that the risks are plateauing, and hopefully we will start to see a decline as we move into May. All that being said, the risk remains very high that you may be exposed to COVID-19, and therefore it's critical that you take steps to protect yourself, notably wearing a mask in all indoor public spaces, making sure you're up to date with your COVID-19 vaccine, staying home if you're unwell, and of course, adjusting your activities just a little bit in order to reduce your potential risk. And that means having social gatherings that are a little bit smaller and go outside. It's getting nice out there. The vaccine continues to be an absolute priority for all in our community. Booster doses are available for everyone over the age of 12, and we recommend that all over the age of 12 consider getting themselves vaccinated. That becomes all the more important the older you get. And for those 18 and older, in alignment with the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, the Health Unit strongly recommends that you receive your booster dose. That booster dose acts as a reminder to your immune system of the tools that it needs to pull out in order to protect you if you are exposed or infected with COVID-19. We know that people who have been boosted can still get COVID-19. However, it's less likely that you will. You're less likely to be symptomatic. You're less likely to be infectious for long. And even if you do develop symptoms, you're significantly less likely to avoid severe outcomes, significantly less likely to have severe outcomes like hospitalizations, ICU admissions, or death. The vaccine makes such a difference. Please make sure that you go and get boosted if you've not yet had the opportunity. A second booster dose is also now available for those 60 and over. And again, I recommend that if you are 60 and over and it's been five months since you received your third dose, that you book your appointment as soon as you can. There are many ways to get vaccinated in our community, including at our mass vaccination clinics at Acreplex in London and the Caradoc Community Centre in Mount Bridges. We will also be spending even more time at White Oaks Mall. We are announcing today that we're extending our time there through the month of May. It's delivered 670 doses since reopening on April 7th, and when we first operated between September 14th and October 10th last fall, in addition to what we've done now, we've administered over 6,300 doses of vaccine. The reason for the White Oaks Clinic, for our mobile clinics that continue to happen throughout our region and our mass vaccination clinic sites is to give everybody an opportunity to roll up your sleeves and get that protection that will help you get through this pandemic as well as those around you. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm gonna pass things over to London Health Sciences Centre Chief Medical Officer, Adam Duclos. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Acting Mayor Morgan, Warden Warwick, and Dr. Summers. As of this morning, you'll see that LHC is caring for 59 COVID-19 positive inpatients, and we have fewer than five in our critical care. Our Children's Hospital, as some of you have already noted in the questions, is caring for 10 patients with COVID-19, and have five, we have five or fewer in our pediatric critical care units. I'm pleased to share that we currently have no active outbreaks. This week is one of particular importance to our hospital. It is Patient Experience Week. This annual event celebrates healthcare staff and physicians who impact the patient experience every day. Patient experience provides a focused time for our organization to celebrate our staff's accomplishments and honor their contributions towards safe and quality patient care and a positive patient and caregiver experience. At LHC, we believe that every staff member, every team member is the patient experience. Every person within our walls touch, touches a patient's experience when they visit us and can impact it. We know the past two years have been difficult and our staff have struggled with the pressure of the pandemic. We want to acknowledge a struggle and then thank them for the important work they do in caring for patients, but also in caring for and leaning on one another. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge two other important celebrations this week. It is National Volunteer Week and we have an amazing team of volunteers at LHSC. And Wednesday marks Administrative Professionals Day, another key member of our team. Without their support, LHC could not offer the patient-centered care that we do. So I'd like to take a moment to say thank you, both to our volunteers, to all of our admin professionals who have helped support our efforts through the pandemic. Your con contributions are important and we truly appreciate you. Thank you to those attending today and we look forward to your questions. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Duclo, Dr. Summers, Warden Warwick, and Acting Mayor Morgan for those opening statements. We'll get to the questions, and we do have a few already here in the queue. The first one comes to us from Dan Brown with the London Free Press, and it is for you, Dr. Summers. Dr. Summers, at last Monday's briefing, you said you would likely be able to tell toward the end of last week and beginning of this week if the sixth wave has peaked in Middlesex, London. How confident are you at this point that we have peaked and if you aren't, when do you think you'll be able to say we've peaked? Thanks for that question, Dan. Uh, I All indicators seem to suggest that we have peaked. I'll be very confident when we see evidence of decline. Uh, making those conclusions is always uh, easier to do in the rearview mirror. Um, I wouldn't say we're necessarily seeing a sustained decline at this point, but certainly we have evidence that things have plateaued at least when it comes to case activity, percent positivity, and wastewater data. The key thing to note is that our hospitalizations and ICU admissions are often lagging metrics. And you remember this from the first round of the Omicron wave where cases went up really quickly. Hospitalizations didn't follow for a few weeks. So we are unlikely to see hospitalizations plateau immediately, even if transmission in the community is plateauing as we speak. Each and every single day, we see a little bit more information, uh, but relative to last week, we certainly see a plateau in any upwards trajectory. Hopefully that continues throughout this week, and by next week, maybe we will see some evidence of decline. None of this, for the record, suggests that people should be adjusting their behaviors yet. Mask, vaccinate, limit your social activities, and like I said, get outside. In that way, we can continue to see that plateau sustain itself and hopefully a decline as we head into May. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers, for that response. Another question here from Dan Brown with the London Free Press, and it is for you, Dr. Duclo. Dr. Duclo, LHSC reported today that there are 10 inpatients who have COVID-19 in Children's Hospital. Dan Brown would like to know how old are they, what's the age range, and how concerned should we be? A second part of the question, how many of these cases were admitted for COVID as opposed to with COVID, and I'm just going to add on to that question with a question from Sawyer Bogdan with AM980 as well. What does this say about COVID-19 cases among children and what is leading to this? Thank you very much, Beth, and thank you for the question. So we're always concerned when COVID inpatient cases climb, and that is especially true for our pediatric patients. Uh, the current age range of children in hospital with COVID uh, is right from uh, the very young or the infant stage up to 17, uh, where after 17 they would start to be in our, our adult hospitals. And the current split of for and with COVID amongst children in the children's hospital is approximately 50-50. So about half of them are in hospital because they have COVID and half are in just happen to have COVID and are in hospital for another reason. While I am concerned, I believe that these numbers reflect the high rates of infection we have seen in our community over the past couple of weeks. As Dr. Sem Summers mentioned, hospitalizations is a lagging indicator. This in increase was unfortunately predictable based on the counts we've seen over the past couple of weeks in our community. And as cases decrease, a few weeks later, we hope hospitalizations will start to decrease. Thank you very much, Dr. Ducolo, for that response. We do have another question here for you from Sawyer Bogdan with AM980 CFPL Global News. Dr. Ducolo, the number of patients with COVID-19 in LHSC has increased by 11 from Friday and 240 staff are off with COVID. Can you talk about the current state of operations? Is there a risk of having to send patients away like you have previously mentioned? Hey, Sawyer, another great question. So like all health organizations, whether it's hospitals or uh, primary care, long-term care, health human resources is the number one concern at this point in time. Our senior leadership team is working diligently to review plans to ensure delivery of essential services uh, and that they're not interrupted. Our, our staff numbers have thankfully decreased at least slightly from last week uh, to 240, and we hope to continue to see that decrease as cases in the community decrease. What we don't want to see is a plateau in those staff numbers and having to to cope with having that many staff off for the you know two or three or four weeks to come. So at this point in time, we continue to off, offer all of our essential services, and we continue to have our surgical services at approximately the 90% level. I don't want to underestimate though how we're doing that. We are 
constantly having to move staff from one location to another in order to be able to provide those services and be able to be available for our community. We are also working with health sector partners like St. Joseph's and other regional hospitals to ensure that patients are flowing through the system properly. Thank you very much, Dr. Duclo, for that response as well. That leaves us with no more questions in the queue for this afternoon's media briefing. I'd like to thank you, Acting Mayor Morgan, Gordon Warwick, Dr. Summers, and Dr. Duclo for joining us, and to the media and the viewers for tuning in this afternoon as well. We will be back to join you on Monday, May 2nd. So until then, have a great week. Thanks for joining us this afternoon.